Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled What's New in Clinical Drug Drug Interaction Studies Recommendations from Regulatory and Scientific Consortia. My name is Candace and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speaker. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank MedPace, who developed the content for this presentation. MedPace is a scientifically driven, global, full-service clinical contract research organization providing phase one through four clinical development services to the biotechnology, pharmaceutical, and medical device industries. MedPace's mission is to accelerate the global development of safe and effective medical therapeutics through its high science and disciplined operating approach that leverages local regulatory and deep therapeutic expertise across all major areas, including oncology, cardiology, metabolic disease, endocrinology, central nervous system, and antiviral and anti-infective. Headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio, MedPace employs approximately 3,200 people across 37 countries. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's event. Dr. Carol Collins has over 20 years of experience in drug-drug interactions, including serving as Associate Medical Director of a Phase I unit. She was a Senior Research Scientist and Clinical Associate Professor in the Department of Pharmaceutics at the University of Washington, where she collaborated on the development of the Metabolism and Transport Drug Interaction Database and as co-investigator on clinical studies. She received her medical degree from Ohio State University and is certified in regulatory affairs and as a principal investigator. She has co-authored numerous publications and presented at national and international conferences on this topic. And now without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic and the presentation over to our speaker, who may begin when they're ready. Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Collins and I would like to welcome you to this presentation where I'll be discussing recent developments in clinical drug-drug interaction studies. So the science of pharmacokinetic drug-drug interactions is a relatively new discipline and it's continually being refined and updated. Companies that understand this science and leverage the information can potentially expedite their drug development timelines and in many cases even bypass clinical studies that would have been required in the past. So after a brief introduction to the mechanisms of pharmacokinetic drug-drug interactions, I want to share some specific points that are critical to a successful DDI program. And I've organize these concepts from those that are of general interest to all scientists in drug development, to those that are interested um, in clinical pharmacology specific development programs, and finally for the, for the experts that are actually designing the trials. The main reference for this presentation are the two new guidances issued by the FDA in 2017. This is the fourth iteration of guidances, uh, or rather draft guidances, that have been issued by the FDA. Um, and in this iteration, they separated the in vitro and transport, uh, metabolism and transport information from the clinical studies. There have been some very good webinars on the in vitro guidance, and that's very technical, um, and I won't try to duplicate that, but there's been less focus on the clinical drug-drug interaction studies, and um, so that's the reason I chose this subject. 
The two other regulatory guidances that serve as primary sources for this talk are the European Medicines Agency's uh, guidance that was released in 2012 and the guidance from the Japanese um, Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. Uh, they recently updated this in 2018. Due to time constraints, I will not be discussing guidances and thought processes from other regulatory uh, authorities, but I do urge you for this to, to determine their thinking and uh, understand their position prior to interacting with those agencies. Um, prior, uh, and a couple of final points before I start my presentation, uh, my introduction. First of all, you'll notice that some of my slides contain a lot of text. I intend these slides to be a reference source for you in the future. And um, I suggest that today you don't focus on taking a lot of notes. This webinar will be available to you at a later date, and then you can uh, watch it again and stop and start it if you want to record the information in the slides. And finally, uh, there a um, glossary of terms and suggested readings will also be available to you after this uh, presentation. You will notice that this, the publication dates, as, as I mentioned in the slide, vary considerably. And um, it would be a mistake to, to consider that um, those documents are, and the agency's positions are static. Uh, and a recent pre-publication from the Journal of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics that was just published two weeks ago emphasized that the regulatory agencies are, are in very close collaboration with the EMA and the FDA talking on, on an almost daily basis. So um, my other suggestion to you is if you're um, developing, your, as you're developing your strategy is to look at the other major regulatory authorities comments on this area because they may actually be aligned with the agency that you're uh, that's particularly of interest to you um, uh, more than the older guidance documents. The phrase paradigm shift has been vastly overused and misused in science, but I can't think of a situation where it's more appropriate than in pharmacokinetic metabolism and transport drug interactions. And we've shifted from an empirical of evaluation that was hit or miss and left a lot of knowledge gaps to a mechanistic approach that um, improves patient safety. And in fact, when this scientific area was expanding the most, over half of drug withdrawals were due to unanticipated uh, pharmacokinetic drug-drug interactions. And so, through the development of this science, we understand that drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters behave predictively. And so prior to the, this understanding, a sponsor would look at their indication, what concomitant medications would be likely prescribed with their investigational drug, and then conduct clinical trials. Nowadays, um, with predictions and decision trees, many of these studies can be bypassed. And as I said, it's been a big step in improving drug safety. And many sponsors have been very enthusiastic in adopting this science because they realize it can expedite their timelines and, and save them considerable money. So the two ways that a company can bypass some of the clinical trials is, is through quantitative, qualitative estimations, which can either involve decision trees or from um, physio physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling that gives a, a qualitative yes or no answer. But the final and a little more complicated way companies may bypass these clinical trials is from more complicated PBPK methodology that can be used to, to predict and simulate the magnitude of interactions 
evaluate the impact of intrinsic and extrinsic factors like disease, uh, sex and gender on the potential for DDIs, and the, thus give an idea of, of whether the magnitude of the interaction um, raises a clinical concern. This is an example of a decision tree from the FDA guidance that was issued in 2012. And this guidance was particularly strong in the number of uh, decision trees that were um, posted. Now, the most recent iteration of the in vitro and in clinical guidances do not include many of these same decision trees. But in querying the FDA, they intend to replace these decision trees and their final document. Um, I just don't have a, a timeline for when that'll occur. So the caveat, this is not a current decision tree, but it, I've used this quite a bit for teaching purposes. And at the bottom is the actual uh, link to where you can find this guidance. Again, as in, for illustrative purposes, not for actual current content. So what you would do as you're approaching um, the risk of a metabolic or enzyme-related drug-drug interaction is first you start with studying the clearance pathways of your drug in, in vitro human tissue. You want to understand if that drug is metabolized by one enzyme or two enzymes, or um, and what if 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 it is what would be the effect of strong inhibitors or inducers on those enzymes? Now, again, there's a separate decision tree for, for transporters, but I, I'm walking you through what a decision tree would look like. So, for example, if you find that there's no one enzyme that's responsible for 25% or greater of the clearance of your drug in um, vitro, then you move on through the no decision tree and you look at whether multiple uh, enzymes would collectively be responsible for more than 25% of the clearance of the drug. If the answer is, again, no, then you, you can proceed to your label with a claim that your drug is not metabolized, and you're done. No clinical studies. On the other hand, if there are yes points in your decision tree, that you need to proceed in other, with other studies, and that may include some clinical studies or several clinical studies, again, depending upon the properties of your investigational drug. The right-hand tree is evaluating your drug as a potential inhibitor or inducer. And we now know that not all drug interactions are competitive. There are some interactions with both enzymes and transporters where the compound binds and permanently disables the enzyme or transporter. Sometimes it's even the metabolite of the investigational drug. So it's not sufficient just to determine your drug is not metabolized. You need to proceed with the in vitro studies. And I'll talk a little later about when these inhibition and induction studies should be completed. So I'd like to give you an example of a drug that was approved in 2019, amifepridine which was um, approved for the indication of Lambert-Eaton syndrome, which is an orphan indication. And you, we see a statement here that lists uh, in vitro studies were, were conducted with multiple enzymes and even transporters, and conclusions were made, and no clinical studies were done. So we can't tell from this statement whether this decision was arrived with via decision trees or PBPGA modeling. And that's often the case. We do know that in vitro studies are the only studies done for um, many indications, and that PBPK is 60% um, of the time when it appears in labeling, it is uh, in relation to DDI potential. So this is very prevalent, um, but I can't give you an exact metric as to uh, when decision trees are used and when PBPK is, is actually utilized for specific indications. A little bit more information on uh, PBPK modeling. As I mentioned earlier, it can be used in a, in a minimal format and a static format for yes-no answers or qualitative estimations, 
or it can be used in quantitative estimations, and it's actively encouraged by the regulatory authorities, and particularly in some situations such as rare diseases and oncology, and for certain special patient populations where it would be um, unsafe for the patients or it's impractical to conduct these studies. And those would include, it's very difficult to recruit patients for renal impairment studies, the ethical issues with performing DDI studies in pregnant women and in pediatrics. And it's also difficult even to get poor metabolizers of, with, um, for these um, drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters. And in these cases, PBPGA can actually be used to predict not only the, the magnitude of an interaction, but it can also predict the impact of altering dose regimens without actually conducting a clinical study. This is a flow chart from the most recent FDA uh, in vitro guidance, and it's very complicated, and it's really aimed at DDI experts and in vitro uh, drug metabolism and transport. But what I'd like to emphasize is it, it's a, it can be quite a complicated modeling situation where you include the physical chemical properties of the drug, its um, clinical properties in terms of its early PK, in terms of volume of distribution, clearance, and absorption. And then finally, you're including your, uh, your in vitro data um, from your in vitro interaction studies. So a PBK, PK model can be as simple or as complicated as needed for the situation. And the underlying linchpin of PBPK is fit for purpose. So it needs to be robust, taken very seriously by companies, and give them answers that the FDA and other regulatory authorities can be confident in. And this is an example, again, from 2019. And this is a JAK2 inhibitor pendralitinib that was approved for uh, oncology indications. And in this case, they did actually conduct a clinical study. And that is they gave their, um, their drug with ketoconazole. And, but using modeling and simulation, they were able to predict what would happen if they increased the fendralitinib uh, dosage or if they used a modern inhibitor of 3A4 instead of um, a strong inhibitor. So again, robust information is a label based on strong PBPGA modeling techniques. So the first question I'd like to answer that should be of general interest to uh, the audience is when should the DDI investigation start? If you look at the Japanese MHLW, um, the information says it should be the you should understand the potential clearance mechanisms for your investigational drug prior to even starting your phase one studies. The EMA is, and the FDA are in concurrence, but I've chosen the the language from the MHLW and the EMA. But and this is the most probably the most important take home message from this webinar. In the latest iteration of the, of the FDA guidance, they make the statement that sponsors should evaluate DDIs, that is, the potential for not only for what distribution and clearance mechanisms are uh, involved in your investigational drug, but, but what is its potential for inhibition and induction of key enzymes and transporters before you give the drug to patients. They further clarify that it's not appropriate to just exclude patients that might be taking drugs that, that could potentially be involved in DDI interactions. So this was a, a, a change in alignment between the major regulatory authorities. And uh, I've seen instances where the FDA has um, enacted this guidance in response to an investigator submissions. The next question I'd like to address for general interest is which species should you study DDI interactions? Again, I've chosen statements from the EMA and the MHLW, but the regulatory authorities are aligned. And the FDA posts this in multiple different guidances, and it's part of the 3R program to reduce 
animal interactions. Drug-drug interaction studies in animals will not inform regulatory decisions. And that's because there's considerable differences between the drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters between the species. So um, using animal data has resulted in unexpected uh, adverse events when the drug was started in humans. And um, interestingly, Paul Watkins in a recent seminar brought up the, the, the converse solution. Um, for example, ibuprofen, which is a drug probably almost everyone listening to this presentation has taken at one point or time. If it had been studied in the traditional pathway of looking at that was in, in, in place prior to the mechanistic uh, science of uh, metabolism and transport interactions, if it had been studied in that manner and given to dogs, it would have never made it to humans because dogs metabolize glucuronidate drugs and clear them much differently than humans, and it's very toxic, whereas obviously it's safe enough for OTC administration in humans. So you may be asking, when can in vitro data be utilized in lieu of a clinical study? And I can't emphasize enough that this, this data and modeling needs to be taken very seriously. You need robust data that includes all the, the met metabolic enzymes and transporters recommended by the regulatory authority. And you need to understand the clinical PK of your investigational drug, including what's the likelihood uh, or, or the degree of exposure that you're most that may be seen in the clinic so if your drug is indicated for a disease where there may be patients with renal impairment how high is their baseline exposure when if you give uh, if you give your investigational drug and what's the impact of inhibition of both uh, metabolism and transport for example in those patients so in many cases, you can avoid actually conducting uh, what would be representative of a worst case scenario if, there, if you meet the criteria for predicting that based on PBPA. And as I move into the section involved in the, your, your development of your clinical DDI program, I'd like to discuss some general design principles for clinical DDI studies. If you're evaluating, or should I say, when you're evaluating your investigational drug as a potential victim of drug-drug interactions, you really need a dose within the linear PK range, but you don't have to use the highest dose. And in some cases, you can use a single dose of your substrate. It's preferable to study a strong probe inhibitor inducer of the metabolizing enzymes or transporters if there's available. And we'll talk about with transporters, that isn't necessarily the case. Now, what do you do if your drug doesn't have not, uh, linear PK? Well, that's problematic and you need to rely on modeling to try to predict this as well as possible. But in that situation, you may need to look at a higher dose in the therapeutic range. When evaluating your investigational agent as a precipitant or a causative agent, the contralateral situation is, is, is in, in play. That is, you need the highest clinical dose, and you need to dose at least to the steady state level of ex parent exposure. That may even need to be extended further if the metabolites of your investigational drug contribute to drug-drug interactions or your drug exhibits either time-dependent inhibition or induction. In that case, you might need to continue your studies long enough to look at recovery of enzyme or transport activity. The exception is when your potential and um, perpetrator is indicated for, a, for a, a single dose, that is one cl a clear example of that is with some of the drugs used in radiology. One final principle in terms of evaluating your drug as an investigational, um, your investigational drug as a participant, pre precipitate, um, is you need to max 
maximize the possibility of an interaction, and that may mean uh, carefully timing co-administration. And so this slide includes the direct quotes from some of the regulatory authorities, and they are just in alignment with the uh, principles I showed you earlier. A question that, that needs to be asked before you actually design your DDI program itself is which metabolic enzymes, and also transporters, but I'm gonna discuss metabolic enzymes first, which need to be evaluated. And that's a very dynamic situation. Um, partially is, that's due to the fact we're learning more and more about some of these more obscure enzymes. But also it's because there's a trend to shift away from metabolism by 3A4. And that's because there's so many drugs on the market that can impact the um, PK of drugs that are metabolized by uh, CYP 3A4. Actually, there's a trend in general for, to produce metabolically stable compounds that don't undergo um, enzymatic transformation. Um, and that creates an additional problem I'll talk about in a little bit is the fact now we're more, we can be more reliant on transporters and we know le much less about their behavior. But to emphasize, um, it's not enough just to test your, your product with the standard SIP enzymes, which would probably be required for most drugs unless uh, the agency feels you've got a special situation, but you may need to focus on non-P450 enzymes, especially the phase two enzymes involved in drug elimination. Um, you need to do further investigations for drugs. Again, as I mentioned, if the elimination pathways are 25% or greater of the clearance in, in um, of your total clearance predictions. But it's not sufficient to say that your drug is not metabolized so we don't have to worry about metabolic drug interactions because the agencies are aligned in requiring um, assays that evaluate for the potential of permanent non-competitive interactions with these enzymes. Now how about transporters? Um, for metabolically stable drugs with poor permeability, we recognize the increasing role of transporters. Um, and that's, that's more challenging because, again, this is a, a newer science. But other issues are that there are few index probe drugs, either as substrates or inhibitors. So we find that the drugs that are either substrates or inhibitors, for, for example, OATP1B1 and OATP1B3, so we can't separate out the, um, the role of each transporter in those interactions. And now we recognize that sometimes there's complex metabolic transporter interactions that um, particularly cause challenges because systemic plasma concentrations may not reflect intracellular concentrations at the site of action. So we may see um, pharmacodynamic effects or adverse events that are not in alignment with the plasma concentration theme. So it's much more challenging. This science is, much in, is, is more in its infancy. Here's a summary um, there then of what enzymes and transporters the regulatory authorities are aligned on and that need to be evaluated as part of your DDI program. And this is a list of the major SIPs. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes you need to consider other drug metabolizing enzymes. Below is a list of the most current uh, transporters. And the agencies are aligned on, on this list with the exception of OCT1, which was uh, recently um, posted in the Japanese um, guidance. The other regulatory agencies have not revised their guidances to include OCT1, OCT1, but I anticipate they will do that in the future. Moving on to 
the types of studies that one would consider in a clinical DDI program. And the first is cocktail studies. What is a cocktail study? A cocktail study is when you concurrently administer multiple probe substrates. And this typically we think of as uh, drug metabolizing enzyme substrates, but it can include transporters to evaluate. And we're doing this to evaluate the inhibition potential for multiple substrates simultaneously. And this obviously can save you quite a bit of time and money because you're conducting one a little more complicated and certainly more expensive study in, instead of multiple clinical drug-drug interaction trials. It also has a particular usefulness in um, situations where there can be confounding due to um, pharmacokinetic variability in drug metabolizing enzymes and transporters over time. An example of this would be inflammatory diseases that produce cytokines that uh, decrease the expression of key uh, drug metabolizing enzymes. So by giving simultaneously multiple drugs, uh, multiple probe drugs, you can evaluate actually what this uh, disease effect may, may have on um, multiple enzymes at the same time. The biggest complication that confounds, um, a, 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 that's a negative for cocktail studies is you need to make sure that the probe substrates don't interact with each other. And that includes pharmacodynamic interactions because if you notice below, many of these uh, potential probe substrates are either um, antihypertensives or in some cases, anti-diabetic drugs. And I've listed below some combinations that have been very prevalent or very popular. Uh, there's certainly many more cocktail uh, that, that are uh, currently active. And this is, you're not, you don't need to write this list down, but just be aware that there's multiple cocktail options available to you. And ideally, you would want to use a cocktail combination that's already been validated. But the, the issue is the agencies can be very flexible on this. So if you're working with an orphan indication uh, where it would be very uh, difficult to conduct a DDI study, they may allow you to use cocktails that um, have not been clinically evaluated but are validated based on in vitro data. What about small dose DDI studies? They're frequently called microdosing DDI studies, but I want to emphasize that microdose actually is a very specific term, in, term for regulatory authorities. And that means you're giving a dose that's 1% of the pharmacologically active dose. And many times a small dose study will not be that low. The primary reason to give them uh, to design a microdosing study is to to mini minimize safety issues for the participants. So if you're dealing with a population that's vulnerable, such as pediatrics, certain oncology uh, situations, um, a microdosing study may be very appropriate. It may also be utilized for situations where you can't give the drug to patients because you're worried about developing drug resistance, such as with HIV, and you want to give the drug to healthy volunteers instead, um, but the drug has uh, side effects that would make it very difficult to conduct in healthy volunteers. There are some considerations that need to be um, evaluated prior to designing a microdosing study. And the first is that going back to that issue of linear PK, it's much more difficult to pre predict the, if the impact um, of a DDI if your drug exhibits nonlinear PK. Um, the other issue is you need a very sensitive assay since you're now dealing with drug concentrations that are likely in, to be in nanograms or picogram levels. So instead of doing um, LCMS, you're likely to re require GCMS MS. So a very more a much more expensive um, and sensitive assay. Finally, to move on to some issues that may be of interest to those actually designing the studies. And the first of that is 
which, which CYP3A4 inhibitor um, should you use in your DDI study? And both the industry academics and, and the regulatory authorities have been struggling with this issue for about seven years. Um, prior to that point, it was not controversial. Ketoconazole was, the, was a drug of choice for a 3A4 inhibition study. But it was either removed from, from, the, from the market or received a black box warning for safety reasons in 2013. And the regulatory authorities are in alignment that you should not use it for DDI studies. So the remaining drugs um, are much less clear cut because they're less sensitive for 3A4. They can inhibit P glycoprotein. Many of them are time dependent inhibitors, and some produce metabolites that are also 3A4 inhibitors. So at the current point in time, the regulatory authorities are allowing other 3A4 inhibitors, but there's an industry consensus that etraconazole should be utilized as a strong probe inhibitor for 3A4. The biggest advantages for using etraconazole is that it's a competitive inhibitor with reversible uh, pharmacokinetics. And um, it also has uh, less side effects, less non-severe side effects than some of the drugs like uh, clarethromycin, which is very difficult to give in clinical trials. Uh, but it has some downsides, is that it's a much more uh, potent p glycoprotein inhib inhibitor, and it's been estimated that up to 50% of its inhibition is due to, to its metabolites. And there's also physicochemical properties that, that make it very difficult to work with etraconazole, and it has made, up to this point, uh, prediction from uh, in vitro predictions um, almost impossible. And I'll get back to that in a little bit later. But moving on to another area that's, that's currently uh, uh, controversial um, among experts, and that's which glycoprotein uh, substrate to use. And again, this is a situation where a few years ago, it was a given. You were going to use digoxin in your uh, PGP DDI study because at that point in time, digoxin was very prevalent in clinical use. But um, notably, it's been found to have much less benefit to patients than was previously thought. So it's, it's prevalence is much less among cardiology patients. But further complicating that is that um, there's data now that suggests that digoxin is neither a specific or sensitive PGP probe substrate. There are other transporters involved, and we haven't characterized them. So both the in vitro and vivo data for digoxin is not really that predictable. Dexacenidine has been studied, but it's even less sensitive to PGP inhibition than, than digoxin. And interestingly, a drug that was more recently approved, the Bigatran, uh, it's administered as, as a prodrug, as the bigotran exfilitate. Ex, um, it's actually very good and much more sensitive for PGP interactions involving the intestine. But the problem is that very little of, of this prodrug reaches the systemic um, circulation, and it's not useful at all for hepatic uh, PGP investigation. So at this point in time, there's no consensus among either the regulatory authorities or um, industrial consortium as to what will be the best choice. And this issue may be further complicated by the fact that um, digoxin may, uh, no, uh, there's significant potential it may be removed from the market. I'm not saying it will be, but it's something to look for. And then we'll be really left scrambling. And the final two points I'd like to discuss is the use of PBPK to, to optimize your clinical study design. So as I mentioned, there's multiple issues with etraconazole, and the International Consortium of Innovation and Quality in Pharmaceutical Development, which is a consortium consisting mostly of experts from industry, uh, they provided a, a PBPK model to to uh, inform optimal study design. As I mentioned earlier, previous PPK models weren't that accurate. So these um, experts collected all the inhibition and in vitro data that was currently available 
and then use their um, their archive specimens to generate time concentration profiles for each reconazole and the three major metabolites that also inhibit 3A4. So they evaluated multiple um, models and then came up with a best fit model uh, to simulate clinical trials and compared that to their test set. So the recommendations from this consortium are that um, the total duration of each econazole should be 14 days. And that's at the point where the potential risk to the participants is greater than the benefits. Uh, they recommend that, that a three-day run-in of each econazole prior to substrate administration is most appropriate. But if your substrate has a long half-life, you may need to consider a loading dose of each econazole. And a previous publication had recommended dose staggering of each econazole uh, and the substrate, but this consortium found that that had no impact on the, on the validity of your modeling. The same type of technique was utilized for rifampin. And uh, the impetus for this is that the EMA in um, 2017 re released a concept paper that um, delineated aspects of their 2012 guidance that they were planning on uh, or considering uh, changing. And so the EMA said that recommended um, rifampin studies should be for 10 to 14 days instead of the usual six to seven days. And um, of note that EMA has always been more conservative in their time course for induction studies, but they had actually um, made this a firm recommendation. Rifampin is a difficult drug. It inhibit, I mean, sorry, it, it induces multiple enzymes and transporters but it also is a potent inhibitor of the transporter OATP1B1. So that means you need to stagger the dose if you give rifampin to a substrate that's both a, a victim of uh, enzymes and OATP1, and the responses are variable. So um, two recent publications have, have um, supported the EMA in their stance, and that's from the induction working group, which is a, a, off, a subgroup of the consortium I mentioned earlier, and the other uh, researchers from Flinders and Allade and Pfizer, and uh, they used a similar approach that was used with ethoconazole, but in this situation, they recommended that it's really appropriate to dose your right hand for, for at least 10 days. So the, the, the previous policy of giving rifampin for only six to seven days is not going to be considered adequate in the future. So the highlights of this presentation are, um, I strongly recommend, based on the, the stance of the regulatory authorities, that you start your DDI program early. And then you carefully assess your program as to whether, if there are opportunities to streamline your clinical development program. That is, the most important thing is try to avoid those expensive clinical studies if possible, and that will involve leveraging modeling techniques and predicting worst case scenario. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm turning the seminar back to uh, controls back to Candice. Well, thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. At this time, I'd like to invite our audience members to continue submitting their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. And for the Q&A, I'd like to hand it back over to our speaker, Dr. Carol Collins. Okay, we have our first question from the audience. And the question is, The um, FDA and the EMA guidelines have differed in their view on using e either total plasma concentrations or free fractions for estimation and simulation of DDI risk. And have these views been aligned in the new guidances? Well, we're still waiting for the revision of the EMA guidance. And they, and obviously you're very correct that there's been different approaches to this. And this is because you know, the regulatory authorities have uh, been very appropriate in um, in uh, preventing uh, pre in um, providing their guidances when the science was was still a little more um, pre uh, 
in its infancy. So, uh, and I'll, I'll actually say that the, the Japanese guidance also has differences from the FDA and EMA. I think in the future, what we're going to be looking at is we're, we need to look at free fractions, free concentrations inside the cells. So for example, if the site where the drug metabolizing enzymes is typically the liver, we need to know the concentration and the hepatocytes. And that's, again, very challenging. So um, this is part of the in vitro guidance that will be uh, submitted, but I think it's in flux and we're, we're, we're um, proceeding toward intracellular free concentrations. The next question is, can you explain the rationale for staggering the doses of the investigational drug in rifampin in induction studies? Well, rifampin has two major types of interactions, and that's induction of drug metabolites and enzymes on transporters, and it's also a competitive inhibitor of OATP1B1, and it's a very potent inhibitor of that transporter. So induction occurs by production of, via transcription, of more drug metabolizing enzyme or transporters, at least in the case of rifampin. With alcohol and CYP2E1, there's a different mechanism in place. Um, but they have very different time courses. So induction takes much longer to occur and much longer to wash out than the OATP effect. So if you give your drug on the same, at simultaneously for a substrate that has OATP1B1 uh, transport uh, impact on its disposition, you're going to see both actions simultaneously. But if you wait 24 hours, the rifampin effect on OATP1B1 will be washed out and all you will see is the induction effect, which is still at full effect. Um, the next question is, how valid is the Geneva cocktail for, for 2B6 probes? And um, actually, do I have the, did I, can we, the Geneva probe. So um, can I go back to that slide? Okay. Oops. Okay, the Geneva cocktail, looks at 1E2, 2B6, 2C9, omiprazole. Hi, Carol. It seems we are no longer able to hear you. If you have yourself muted, could you please unmute? Um, Candace, we don't, we're not on mute. Can you hear us now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. I'm not sure what happened. Sure. So the Geneva cocktails is one of the first cocktails that was uh, designed and validated. Um, it looks at a mul multitude of um, of sipid enzymes and actually PGP simultaneously. And the probe substrate for 2B6 is bupropion. And as we know now, you bring up a very good point that it's not the greatest probe. Um, and it also can have effects on some of the other probe substrates because it's a very potent inhibitor of 2D6, which would affect your uh, evaluation of the effects on dextromethorphan. So uh, there have been attempts to replace this with efavirins, which is an inducer, so it has its own problems. And I'm not aware of a consensus at this point as the best choice for 2B6. It may um, in, in fact, involve giving a single dose. Uh, the next question is, are the statements re related to the regulatory authorities' comments for data and studies true across all product types? For example, peptides or peak -glyc glycolated peptides? That's a good question. And there's actually a guidance that's going to be coming out uh, very soon, uh, or at least the FDA has intent, uh, have said they've intended to post this very soon um, on the oligonucleotides. 
And interestingly, the in vitro data has been contradictory as to whether the, there's a risk for um, impacting uh, drug metabolizing enzymes or not. And it seems to depend upon the assay method utilized. So um, the overall answer, quick answer is no, it's not, uh, the requirements are not the same for uh, different types of products or for different disease indications. And um, another issue is with uh, the biologics. Some of these, these studies are clearly not appropriate or are not helpful. So that's an area where you need to look at the guidances. Um, unfortunately, the, um, some of them, like the FDA guidance, don't talk a lot about therapeutic proteins and they don't talk at all about oligonucleotides. But um, this can be best addressed in, in discussions with the regulatory authorities prior to actually formulating your, your uh, or finalizing your DDI program. Um, let's see, we, uh, let, we have, uh, another question. Um, please explain the strategy for determining the dose duration for each aconazole inhibition studies. Well, each aconazole itself has some potential for adverse events that may be, um, almost as great as ketoconazole. Uh, at least from looking at its clinical usage. Um, and some of those are, are, it also is involved in patotoxicity. And um, I've even seen cases where participants, uh, male participants develop gynecomastia. Actually, that was only one case, but it was very troubling for the participant. Um, so uh, it's been uh, decided as consensus that uh, regardless of whether you decide to use etraconazole or not for your 384 inhibition study, the, the, the risk associated with increasing the dose um, uh, duration more than 14 days is not appropriate. So again, um, because uh, that leaves us a situation is, what if your substrate has a um, a longer half-life and won't be uh, washed out by the end of that 14-day study or close to the end of that 14-day study. Then you run the risk that um, the competitive inhibition of each aconazole is decreased and doesn't reflect the true clinical situation where, of co-administration. So one way to try to um, minimize that risk is to load up your etraconazole um, with a loading dose immediately on day one, and that's going to increase your etraconazole, but more importantly, your metabolites that are also involved in 3A4. So currently, that's the best recommendation we have for, um, for design of, of studies with, for substrates with longer half-lives. This may change in the future because I've mentioned we're still stuck with all the problems with each aconazole, but we don't have a better substrate. And I believe we have time for one final question. That's what about the case of drugs where the major enzyme or transporters cannot be characterized using the use of the models? And that's unfortunately a situation that's going to happen more and more frequently because we're moving to situations where um, other enzymes other than the P450s are uh, involved in, in um, drug clearance, and also we're dealing with transporters that we don't know much about. Again, this is a situation where it's best to talk to your regulatory authorities prior to finalizing your DDI program and even your in vitro studies, for example, in a pre-IND um, uh, submission, um, because it's likely that they're going to require you to conduct the standard in vitro studies because, again, your investigational drug may be an inhibitor inducer of these enzymes without actually being a substrate of those enzymes or transporters. But then um, th they can give you some input, and they're actually very expert in this area on what are the enzymes they would like you to study. And it's better to do this ahead of time uh, prior to, to starting your clinical program.
Okay. So that looks like all the questions we have time for today. I'm going to turn back the control of this presentation to Candace. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much for that Q&A session. We've now reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If we were unable to attend your questions during the Q&A, the team at MedPace may try to follow up with you. If you have further questions, please direct them to the contact information showing on your screen. We also invite you to register for MedPace's upcoming webinar entitled, The Race for Children Act Will Change the Landscape for Pediatric Cancer Research. Are you ready for August 2020? At this time, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speaker, Dr. Carol Collins, and feel free to share the recorded version of this webinar when it becomes available using the link in the chat box. We hope you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.